Actually good because I was planning on starting with what yet what you got here. Um, so I gave you a handout of two maps. So we'll be talking about maps today. Um, and uh, what I want you to do is to like take the first five minutes and think about what is the problem with those maps. These are all maps that are like fairly standard, but I would like you to think about uh, like one of each of these maps has like one significant problem. Liz Hockey will be talking about that a lot today. And so just take five minutes in a group and, and talk about what are the problems with these maps. Yeah, I think Marshall is a lie. 
and the class started 10 minutes ago, so. Okay, so good chance that we won't get to won't get the AV work here today. Um, so maybe let's just talk about this. I actually have another design critique done for today, but I'll be I would be talking about maps. So after doing this plus the design critique, if the AV doesn't work, there's no point in hanging around here. Um, so maybe let's take a step back and take this as an opportunity. Anybody have any questions for the project? Uh, you need um, a kind of like think of it like as an, an I like first you need the idea, the title, and the data set, and you need to describe like what your data is um, and where you will get it and so on. And then you need to kind of come up with uh, sketches and the design. Like first you should come up with analysis questions that you want to answer. Right? Tell us why do you care about this? Um, what is interesting about this data set? What are you expecting to find? What are you expecting to show? And then after that, um, you should come up with uh, solutions, design solutions for uh, the project, right? And so you should come up with um, a couple of sketches um, that show your visualizations and explain us what is going on and why did you pick those sketches and so on. And maybe even like develop a couple of alternatives and then you can talk with your TA, which you'll be assigned, which you'll be assigned this week uh, about like after you've submitted this to get feedback and see whether this is actually what you want to do. Okay. Um, and then you should have a list of features um, of like things that you definitely want to get to and things that you like would like to get to, but you're not totally sure whether this works out in time. And then other nice to have features which you expect might be tough uh, to implement in that time frame. Does that answer your question? Great. So we know that the proposal is due on Friday, but there's no time mentioned. Uh, by Friday. Uh, so the way you submit it is um, you put a PDF into your GitHub repository that you just shared with us. And then we will be looking at that sometime um, over the weekend and early next week. And if we don't find it, your submission is late. It's not like it's not a homework grad right, where we have like a exact deadline. Um, you should submit it essentially Friday uh, by midnight. Um, but we're not going to check for time. There's no going to be a late penalty other than if your TA wants to check it and it's not there, then um, you will get a late penalty. Kind of um, so the TAs, um, like the TAs, are your kind of like first line of defense. Uh, essentially, and you can ask them, like the, the TAs are partially some, they are students that have taken this class, um, and partially they are PhD students who work in visualization, uh, and then, um, so you should expect, they should be knowing about all of the visualization design principles and so on, um, and they will meet with you individually at some point and give you feedback on whether they think this is a satisfactory project. If you feel like uh, you would like to get support from me, you're welcome to come to my office, ours too. Uh, can you say that again? Uh, how large is the project should be? A uh, one page or a whole website? Uh, one page or a whole website? Yeah. The proposal or the project? The whole, the whole project. The, I can't, this is not easily to, easy to answer, right? It's usually, um, like it, it, you will build a web page. Um, and, and, and that will have a couple of components that should include your video and so on eventually. Um, but it could be something very small, but more likely it's going to be something where you scroll a bit. 
And I always said that, I don't know whether this is very explicit in the instructions, but I, I strongly encourage to do like a narrative project, right? And not just to show some data, but to actually tell a story about what is going on with the data. So like if you start out by analyzing and exploring your data with the visualization that you built, but then you find something, um, and then you should like have somehow captured its state and then tell us a little bit of a story, similar to what the New York Times always does, right? Like if you think about this um, 3D yield curve chart that we talked about, first you see the data and then you can look at it in different ways, but then you have the stepper interface where you could click and then they describe some observations. That's like not, not strictly necessary, but every great project that I've seen in the past has done that and that's a little bit more, let's say, like easy to communicate uh, than just like a visualization system where I just can explore my data. I'll probably make this like a mandatory requirement in the future. Yes, um, you will not necessarily implement exactly what you did in your proposal, right? And that's why we also have a process book where you essentially document uh, changes that you've made and why you've made them, what you found was the problem. Yeah? Does the visualization have to be completely original or can we like implement something that's similar to what's already out there? Uh, I'm not expecting you to implement something completely original uh, because that would be a research paper, right? And this is not so easy. Um, but like, it, it should be like some novel combination, right? I, like, you, like, for example, if you use the standard, like the, the standard blocks uh, implementation of a parallel coordinate view, will like that's good. That can be helpful, and you're definitely allowed to use that if you quote the, the, the code. But we will, we know, of course, that this is like a standard implementation. Uh, and therefore, we only count this as a small part of your project, right? So you can use somebody else's code. Um, you can copy from blogs, but but uh, we want to see you come up with an original project. That means a combination of a data set, the visualizations that you choose, and the story you tell. Like, and a combination of those three should be novel. But that doesn't mean that this needs to be a novel visualization. Yeah. Uh, if you have streaming data or anything that changes, that is totally fine with us. It's going to be a little bit more challenging from a technical perspective, right? So the easier projects are probably where you have like one CSV file or two or three CSV files plus some file where you have annotations uh, and then just work with that instead of having like a streaming API that you work against. But if you have a data set like that and want to work with that, that's fine. Anything else about the project? From the story and the, like, what, how we are implementing it, it should be novel. Yes, so like, it, it, there should, it, it's, as I just said, there should be like a, something unique about your project, and that can be in the combination of data set visualizations and how you tell the story. And then um, let me look at the schedule. So, how the project is going to work, like the Friday deadline is um, going to be graded as part of your project grade. And then next week, I think, we have a peer feedback session. So, yeah, so um, next week on Tuesday, we'll have a peer feedback session. And I'll take attendance for that. Um, so it's mandatory that you're here. Um, and um, at least if you can't, you should write me an email. Then you should make sure that at least somebody from your team is present. Um, and so the way this is going to work, like I'm not going to lecture. Um, I'm going to like come in here and then like moderate. Um, and then you will team up. Like you have two teams uh, sitting together and then pitching each other each um, your projects based on your proposal. So maybe bring a printout of your proposal or bring your sketches and so on for that on Tuesday. Um, and then you will tell uh, the group what your project is. They will tell you what they think about it, give you feedback. You um, should write down that feedback and then uh, also report on uh, what uh, you are planning on doing to address this feedback. And then you hand that in together with your milestone. Um, 
And so that's uh, a mandatory component, and usually this has been quite successful. And so we'll have that on Tuesday. And then a couple of weeks later, after your first uh, project milestone in week 13 and the week between November 14th and 18th, uh, we will have mandatory meetings with your TAs. Um, and so then your TAs will check in and, and look at your milestone and let you know whether you're in a good path or whether you need to do something to kind of turn your project around. Okay, any other questions about the project? Oh, and then another recommendation, like we were expecting you to host a website uh, for this project, unless you have some confidential data or some private project, then you should talk to me. Um, my recommendation for doing that is to simply uh, develop from the beginning as a website in the GitHub Pages branch. Like, I don't know whether you know about this, but GitHub essentially, um, you have a GitHub repository that has a master branch, but GitHub also lets you easily host whatever you have in the repository by simply creating a branch that's called GitHub Pages, GH-Pages. Um, and then you can actually like, link to that project site. Um, I'll, put in a, uh, I'll put up a link, and I'm sure there's a link also in the project description, but I'll, I'll add a reminder uh, to Slack how to do that. Um, and so then your project is always going to be publicly accessible, um, and then we can easily look at it um, and, uh, without having to download it and run a web server ourselves. Yeah? Can we use other networks other than this uh, What's that? Other networks? Yeah. Uh, you mean another server? Libraries. Uh, libraries. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, you can use libraries with some limits, right? Uh, if you use a charting library that's on top of T3 and only use those, we, we of course know that, right? And we'll kind of like count this as a smaller contribution, but you can use like any library that you think will help you create a good visualizations. So like there's, for example, JavaScript libraries to, for, for annotations and so on uh, that could be helpful. But if you're in doubt, then just ask on Slack. So you can't use like a run-of-the-mill solution. Uh, there's some charting libraries out there where we just have to like do like two or three configurations, right? And then you'll have a couple of charts there, um, standard charts. But that's that's that will clearly not be a great project. Okay, so then let's talk a little bit about these maps. Uh, the first one, the Path, the red and blue one that shows us which counties Bush and Kerry have won. Anybody want to say something about that? Why is this not necessarily a great map? Yeah. You can't necessarily identify like which county is it. Like, if I want to know like uh, Vildan to a certain county, I can't do that. Because unless I know about the where each county belongs, it's uh, So what do you mean by that? Um, you can't, like, you can't read the labels for the counties? Yeah. Okay. How could you fix that? So probably have some kind of a hovering thing, like, which maps to the county name or something like that. Yes, yeah, so we could, like, do a details on demand with a tooltip to see the county names and maybe even also show the exact proportions of the win, right? But what we have in the like, American presidential electoral system is we have electoral votes, so we have a winner takes all, uh, for Congress at least, not for states. And this is like for, uh, for, uh, for uh, on a county level, that doesn't necessarily tell us who won the state, right? Mm -hmm. um, so anything, anybody else who, uh, anything else that you notice about this map? Also, it is, way too much mining data because the size of the county is really small. So at that point you have issue of crowding too much data in one pixel. Yeah. So you probably have like in Nevada or also in Utah, there's counties that uh, have a size where you could probably fit in the northeastern region, you could fit in 15 or 20 other counties, right? Um, how are these counties divided? Like, anybody know that like from the political system? Actually, don't think they're necessarily by population, right? The uh, congressional districts are divided by population, but not the counties themselves. They're just like naturally or historically created. So it doesn't really tell us anything about population, whether the counties are uh, big or small. Um, anything else? Does anybody remember what the result was, Kerry versus Bush? Roughly? By? 
286 versus 251. 286 versus 251. So it seems like that Bush won like 95% of the vote, but it was not the case. <laughs> exactly. And why is that? Why does it seem like that? The electoral system. Yes. So we have the electoral system, but why does it look that big here? Because there are counties which are larger in area, but doesn't represent much electoral votes. Yes. So we have a mismatch of like the the, the space that a county takes up um, and the number of like people that live in it, which kind of then make up the electoral votes. And that's something if we see political maps like this of the United States, we very commonly like it's it's kind of like common knowledge that Republicans do better in rural areas, whereas Democrats do better in urbanized areas. And and urban areas are of course like more densely populated, so there's more people living in a smaller area, and therefore they, they tend to be underrepresented um, in a core path map that simply does it like that. And we'll be talking a lot about solutions if we get the AV fixed today, otherwise on Thursday. Anybody else want to say anything about this map? Can we use you to kind of fix this problem? Because each county, I mean, not so you could try to kind of resize the counties uh, by their population, right? But that gets tricky very quickly. I'll actually show you some visualization techniques to do that. Um, as a possible solution, what if you just um, show an overview with this zoomed out image and then when the person clicks on the state, you zoom into the state and then show the exact counties with the size. So um, that the zoom in level is also... Yeah, there, that you could like essentially what like one approach that you could take is not show the counties but show only the states, right? But then still, how many electoral votes does Utah have? Four. How many electoral votes does California have? Something like fifty plus. And so there is like Utah is not as big as California, but it's probably half the size and not like a tenth of the size, right? So we have this problem at multiple scales. Um, um, also, let's talk about the second map. Like, the second map, what does it show us? The land on Earth. The land on Earth. Anybody notice anything? Yes, Antarctica looks huge. And why do you think that is? This projection, it's supposed to be like this, but they really stretched it and made it flat, so exactly. that's why it got expanded. So this picture shows a Mercator projection, and the problem with the Mercator projection is um, it's um, a, th a cylindrical projection, so what happens is we have the Earth, which is a sphere, and then we wrap around like a virtual sheet and project every point onto it, onto the sheet, right? And so as you can see in this map is that Antarctica, because it's at the bottom here, gets a lot of space because of this way this is projected. And so why is this a problem? Why would you think that's a problem? It gives an incorrect idea about the portion of land to water or to land masses with each yeah. other. Okay, let me just talk to this guy for a second. So, usually there's just an iPod here, which has been punched out. And there is seems to be a fake time here, it's not a in here. And the VGA doesn't work in here. Another check and everything's out there. Um, I would, but I could swear it out. So, we wanted to use sound. I'm good for like if I can get it to work on sound, but it wasn't good for today. Oh, right, you're, you, so you're trying to use it today, right? I have an issue with my people too. Yeah, but it's not this one. I tried that too, but it didn't work.
two, one, two different kids. I'm always surprised you that's the case. talked fundamentally that it distorts the land mass, right? But why is that a bit of a problem from like an ethical perspective? Exactly. So all like the rich industrialized countries which are in the northern hemisphere, like further up north, appear to be big. And then countries in Africa and anywhere along the equator uh, tend to be pretty small in comparison. So we have kind of like this distorted view of how the, like the, how the world looks like if you look at the projection like this. Um, and that has implications in, in many ways, right? Um, culturally, um, and also for, of course, data visualization. Okay, so generally speaking, when we talk about maps, we have a couple. Like, there's a couple of principles. What you think? Um, what you think about spatial data and maps? Uh, maps are like a very special type of data, um, and my recommendation to you is that you would use maps only when the spatial position is really paramount. So there is, of course, things like when you want to plan a route to drive somewhere, the spatial positions are really super relevant. But then there are scenarios uh, when the spatial positions are not as important. Like the tasks that you could do with a map are things like find the location or find the feature, like a county, a country, a city, a street, uh, to find the route, like how are two things connected, uh, to identify attributes associated with the location, things like the elevation, uh, whether something is land, water, or whether there's a forest, and then you can of course map data on top of it. Um, and then, like ideally, you also want to be able to compare attributes between locations and features. But like one of the core things whenever you work with geospatial data is like the question that you should always ask yourself, and this is also the reason why I like, moved this lecture up, uh, is do I really need a map just because I have geospatial data, right? A lot of the data that we have is geospatial, uh, but very often we wouldn't need a map to show that. For example, everybody knows uh, roughly where each of the states in the United States are, right? So I don't need to like, have a map that shows me where Utah is on the map to show who won Utah. Uh, or I don't have to have a map uh, to show like, how, who, how many um, Chinese athletes, athletes won gold medals at the Olympics. If people have an idea of where China is in the first place um, and they have an understanding of like, what China is, they don't necessarily need to see a map. There's of course exceptions to that where you actually do need it, um, and then maps are very useful. So something happens.
Yes. Finally. <laughs> Is going to be like classes? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so like here is a good example of um, a data set. Like here, this is a good uh, like a visualization that I do like a lot um, about the uh, shift of the political climate in the United States over many years. So what we have here is a data visualization of how states have swung from left to right. Um, so we see, like in the, this goes up to the, um, what is it, 2008 election. Um, so we have Obama and Romney. And then we can go down here and see exactly of how the states shifted. And so we see, for example, under Reagan, almost all of the states were right of the center. So almost all of the states were won by Reagan, and we see by which percentage margin. And so Utah actually had 74.5 percent for uh, Reagan. Is actually Utah is a is an interesting outlier always. Um, <laughs> but here uh, for Romney, of course, Romney is the biggest outlier in Utah. Uh, and we'll see later that like uh, Donald Trump was actually uh, Utah swung heavily to the left uh, when Donald Trump was being elected. Still, Republicans won the state, which is not surprising since he, they won, uh, Romney won 72% of the vote. Um, but uh, it's, it's interesting to see. And so what are we showing here? We're showing here like the proportions of the victory for each state. We have to hover over it, right, to see which state it is. Um, but we, uh, and we also see um, that this proportion over many different years. And that data would be really tricky to do in a map, right? If you have, uh, if you have like 20 elections and you want to show for every state how the state has swung, it's really hard to do. Um, how would you do that? You could try 20 maps, but you wouldn't be able to notice like these massive swings here. For example, here we have Alabama, which was won by Goldwater uh, with 70%, and then the next year it went actually to a Democrat. And these kinds of effects, they're pretty pronounced in this kind of chart. And so the point of this chart is, um, just because data is, has a geospatial reference, we don't necessarily need to always show it on the map. But, uh, and here's another one. Um, the, this is like from the 2016 election, Clinton versus Trump. Um, and so it's really hard to do more complex things with the map. So we have here um, like percentages by how much the candidates won, but we also have a visualization of uncertainty. Um, this, this was uh, like right before all of the uh, um, electoral votes were uh, counted, uh, all of the votes were counted, um, and so we had a margin of error. How do you visualize a margin of error if you just have, like, if you just co uh, color um, a state, right? That's really hard to do. So you need to uh, come up with a different representation. But still, like we know Colorado, uh, there's a margin of error in Colorado. We don't necessarily need to see the, uh, the state of Colorado and where it's located in. Of course, sometimes it can be interesting. OK, so this was kind of like the preface. And now we'll be talking about maps, because maps are actually can be super useful if used correctly. So why do we use projections? We already talked about this, uh, that we have a sphere and the, usually um, the, uh, what we use to view a map is on a flat, either uh, on a flat surface, either a piece of paper or a screen. Of course, that's not the case with a globe. So you don't have to worry about projection uh, if you use a globe and there's also actually spherical displays. So you could also do, in theory, like interactive uh, uh, globes. But in practice, uh, really what is important is, is these kinds of projections. Um, and um, the standard one is the Mercator projection that we just talked about. Um, it's from 1569, and this is really this projection onto a cylinder. Um, and what is nice about this map is that we have line of constant bearing uh, that are, are straight lines. So that means, essentially, I can use a compass 
look at my map, what is the degree relative to north that I have to sail towards, um, and that will work with the, with the Mercator map. I'll arrive at the position uh, that I intend to do. Uh, but that is not like, how many of you have ever used a compass to navigate in the last two years? One person. <laughs> so that's not a use case that we nowadays have a lot, right? Uh, if you're like in the 1600s, then of course that's interesting. So here's this map. Um, this is a Mercator projection, projection of Mars. Um, and also, um, notice that this is nice because circular craters uh, that you see on Mars, they, are, they appear as circles because we don't have to this angular distortion here. So why is Mercator problematic? Um, it was traditionally used to teach geography and we have this massive distortion and it's unfair to the global south as we just discussed. Making places that are mostly trees, snow, and better off white people look huge, and the places where most of the world population uh, lives to look puny. Uh, and this is like, I really like this quote, Mercado works really great if you're, say, Ferdinand Magellan looking for a compass bearing that will take you around Cap Horn, because all of the latitude and longitude lines and the angles in between lay out nice and straight on the map like we experience them in real life. It also works well if you're Google and you want a map image that you can neatly slice up into little squares, that your service sends to a customer's browser. North is always up, your hometown doesn't look squished or slanted when you zoom into it and everybody's happy. Like these are the kind of like the benefits of the Mercator projection. We'll talk more about the Google Maps uh, example later. But then this is a good example of Africa in perspective, right? I can take uh, China, the US, Argentina, all of Western Europe and all of India and pack it into Africa. And it's something that we simply don't have as a mental model of the size of Africa, mainly because of these projections. And so this is like a nice example, which I kind of like challenge you to do with me now. Like here I have different countries. Let me zoom in a bit. Here I have different countries and I can move them around. And then when I move them further up north, you can see that they increase in size. And if I move them close to the equator, you can see that they shrink. And if they move them to Antarctica, it's suddenly this massive country. So what country am I handling here? It's Algeria. What's this? It looks like China. It's actually Russia. What's that? It's something in Africa because of the straight lines. Mali. What do we have here? Anybody know? Because I don't. <laughs> Malaysia? Oh yeah, Malaysia. Great. Interesting how different the size here was. And that could be... Iceland? A Caribbean country? Yes. No. <laughs> Probably somewhere. Okay, anyways, I'm. <laughs> I think, what is this? Brazil? Yes. No. <laughs> it's also not China. Uh, it's probably well. It's hard. <laughs> Is it Africa? Okay, I'm giving up. You can play with this later. It, it's an interesting country because we have like a little, uh, like probably a lake or another country inside it here. But anyways. Okay, uh, this is just a good illustration of uh, like how difficult it is. And, and here you see that uh, um, this is Australia um, and how big it would look if it were in the place of Greenland. Um, so this is of course only a problem if you look at the map of the world. If you look at a map of Salt Lake City, this is not a problem. Uh, there is simply not enough distortion. Even if you're further up north, um, it, it's, it's simply not a problem. Uh, on the state or city level. And there, uh, the benefits of the Mercator are outweigh their, um, their um, downsides. 
And so that's why, for example, Google Maps actually uses a Mercator projection. But if you go into the satellite mode and you zoom out, it suddenly transforms into a globe. Um, you can also uh, simply plot latitude longitude, which does not preserve the angles, it does not preserve the areas, and it's also squ uh, squashed at the top and the bottom. So this kind of looks also quite unfamiliar. Greenland looks very, very wide, but very, not very high. So that's also not a great approach for projection. There's azimuthal projections where I essentially um, take uh, the sphere and project it onto a, a disk, um, which essentially makes angles that are uh, uh, correct from the center point. And this is kind of like a, um, a, a, a and also the, rad, or the right, red eye are, correspond to true distances from the center point. So this is kind of like something that's a very special purpose projection, right? If you have one point on Earth and just want to show everything in relationship to that one point, then that could be a good, uh, a good uh, example. So here is a good example uh, of how that was used, like uh, how people are traveling around uh, the country like uh, for this Time Life magazine somewhere in the 60s or 70s. Uh, Winkle triple projection is a modified azimuthal map projection which is average to a cylindrical projection and it kind of like minimizes three kinds of distortions uh, the area, the direction, the distance none of those is absolutely faithful but this is considered to be kind of like a good projection for, uh, for use in world map and it's actually endorsed by the National Geographic Society for the use in textbooks um, so this is what that looks like and that is kind of like a fair approximation now of all of those things like distance, angle, and surface area. Um, and so this is kind of like if you want to show a world map, that would be a recommended projection. Of course, New Zealanders might disagree because they're hard to see down here. Um, but yeah, they, they left off even of our homework map. So um, here is um, circles of equal size uh, so that you can get a sense of the distortion. So you can see that there is quite a bit of distortion, especially on these edges. Um, but like most of those cases are actually pretty good. Um, Albus equals area uh, is a special case for uh, that is like a projection that is tailored to the United States. It does show the area correctly, uh, but it distorts distances and shapes. So this is kind of like the standard uh, US map that we see very often as a special handling for um, Alaska and Hawaii so that they fit on the same screen. Um, and this is a very neat project that um, shows us composite projections. So we have, like here, um, this is the projection diagram, and we can see, uh, we can see that there is um, different, oops, that there is different um, projections that are used here, and we have a smooth, transitions between, a smooth transition between them. Okay, so here we see this is like a, uh, I can move the globe around and do this projection dynamically, but then what's interesting is um, I can essentially use here this dot and move it around to zoom in, and then you see that it switches between, here we have a Lambert as little projection, then we have an Alvarez conic projection, and then if we zoom in further and further, we, get, we switch into the Mercator projection. So here is kind of like a little bit of a harder transition for some reason. It shouldn't be like that. Uh, but yeah, so these are kind of like ideal projections at these different scales and also at these different polar aspects. So the, not every projection is equally well suited to any, um, any particular area and zoom level. And so this is like a composite visualization here. Uh, we, like Carolina has given this lecture on maps in, in D3. Uh, D3 has a lot of different map projections included. Uh, we've talked about them, so in the interest of some time, I'm going to skip over it. Uh, but these are pretty fancy, and D3 is a really great tool uh, for working with uh, maps and projections. And this is a, like a nice idea. Um, like, think about when you peel an orange, right? You peel it off, and then you have these little slices of it. And so if you peel carefully, you can essentially um, have the peel flatten out on, on a desk. Um, and the idea is that you simply tear, uh, the, um, uh, tear the surface of, in this case, the sphere of the orange uh, slightly. And this guy, Jörg von Weick, has kind of like come up with these interesting ways of unfolding the Earth. And this is a really nice video. 
Um, it's very short. It just shows you how you could fold the earth uh, if you kind of tear up different places. So here we just do some regular grids. And it really gets interesting if there, when he starts to do some semantically meaningful grids. So for example, uh, you can parameterize this algorithm to cut along uh, so that you only cut ocean. Um, that's, I think, one of the last ones. So here we're now cutting only along the oceans, or mostly, you can see there is a cut in Europe, different way of cutting along the oceans. And then you could also cut only along the land masses, which of course creates a very bizarre uh, map because we simply don't used to think about this in this way. Okay, so this just shows you that you can do very uh, interesting and crazy things with projections. Uh, if you're interested, in, like, this is, there's, whole classes on this, right, on geographic information systems, there are whole like, programs of studies on projections and on uh, geodesic uh, information systems. Um, this is like a nice slide deck uh, that goes a little bit more into, the, into depth about projections. If you're interested, um, I'll, uh, you can then look at the link when I share the slides. Okay, next I wanted to talk about map software and navigation. And so we have talked a little bit about Google Maps when we talked about how we can do visualization on top of Google Maps. Um, essentially, there's like Apple Maps, Google Maps, and OpenStreetMap, which are kind of like the big three vendors um, uh, for, for maps. And OpenStreetMap is, of course, nice because you can all get all of the data. So if you want to do a custom project and maybe even sell it, uh, you can use OpenStreetMap. Uh, Google Maps also provides nice APIs. Um, and and these, these mapping softwares are great and getting better by the day and are very convenient. When we want to use them for navigation, we always uh, have and like there's three different modes essentially. There's like the real-time navigation guidance system where I need also positioning information, but I'm gonna glance over that because it's not really irrelevant for visualization. Uh, but if you use navigation on a map, you also have like a choice between a very specific um, visualization of the route that you have to take or something very abstract. So if you, for example, want to go for a beer in Porcupine after class, uh, this is the map that will show you how you can get there by public transport. Uh, so you have to walk down to the, the street down there, hop onto the bus and ride it uh, until like President Circle and then get off and walk the rest of the way. Um, and here's a more abstract representation. So if you know where North Campus Drive is and if you know where University Street is, this might actually be the better visualization for you, right? Because this just gives you timing information. Um, and so it, it's kind of abstract. Uh, but it is super useful if you already know the context. And so before we all had smartphones, people used to draw maps to tell people how to get from point A to B. And those maps didn't look like real maps, right? They were like, get onto interstate this and this, take exit there and there, then it'll come by this gas station, uh, and so on. And so we, we, we think in landmarks if we write, like, draw a map like this. And there have been some research projects to actually try to transfer this natural way of, for us of thinking about it um, into, um, into computer systems. So here is a, a map that goes from like Wisconsin Madison to um, somewhere, what is it? Kalamazoo in, in Michigan. Uh, and um, like here you see like a concrete map that shows you all the little wiggles uh, that you have to drive through. But they developed an algorithm that essentially highlighted, like, had roughly the directions, but then highlighted only the relevant intersections. So this is kind of like a simplified version. Um, it has a lot less context, but it has all of the information uh, that you would need. Um, and it is much closer to what users would actually draw or people would actually draw. And Microsoft did implement when Microsoft still uh, had uh, a navigation system and a map. Uh, they, they did implement this uh, technique. Uh, but unfortunately, it has like said, since been removed like many years ago. Okay, uh, so now let's start talking a little bit about when we want to map data on top of uh, a map. 
And so the simplest one is direct mapping. We have a map and then one data point maps to one pixel or 10 data points map to one pixel. What do I mean by that? So we can create mashups like this. This is a, um, there was a, a shooting in, um, a sh school shooting, I think it was in Pennsylvania, um, or it was in New York, this is a New York map, but it was a Pennsylvania shooting. Um, and so um, these guys, this was like a newspaper, a group of newspaper reporters, they went to a public website, scraped information about gun ownership, which is public record, um, and then put a dot uh, of every gun owner in the New York State on a map. And you could zoom in and actually look at whether your neighbor is a gun owner or not uh, in New York uh, State. Um, so here you can actually zoom in and resolve individual addresses. What do you think happened next? <laughs> so there was a lot of discussion about this piece and the original piece is actually not online anymore and the editor got fired. Um, and actually, like, this is an interesting ethical question. Um, what are the ethics of digitalization? They have taken data that is a public record and they have only made it more accessible. So, like, strictly speaking, you're doing something that everybody could do, right? It's just by creating something, like using publicly available data and making it more accessible, are you, like, is to, has, does, this have, uh, does this have any ethical implications? I just have a question. Why is this problematic? Uh, well, people uh, don't want you to know whether they, they own guns, right? And, uh, and lots of gun owners say, like, I'm a responsible gun owner. Why am, I, why am I being claimed as somebody who is related to a school of school killing? Um, it seems simply like, is kind of like, you can make an argument, right, that gun ownership is not, it's nothing illegal. Why do I need to show a map in the context of a school killing like that? Um, and, and that is kind of like, I, I, I could get where they're coming from, right? It is an ethical problem. Yeah. You know, I don't think it shows the entire picture because this is the registered gun owners. Yes. And so what about all the gun owners? That are not registered, they use illegal weapons and so on. Um, and there's like a, also a big difference of what kinds of guns you own and so on, and that's also not in there in this map. So this is just like a reminder that just by using information that is available, you still have to think about the consequences of what you're doing and how you're making them accessible. There's actually a story of a, um, a colleague of mine at Turkey Tech. Um, his students have scraped a database of all of the Georgia Tech is a public school too, and they scraped their professor salary of the computer science department and made their class project to visualize the professor's salary. <laughs> <laughs> it did not stay on the internet. It's actually also public information in Utah. Um, you can look at racial and ethnic groups like this. Uh, this is a very good uh, piece by the New York Times from 2010. Um, this is the ethical makeup of uh, Salt Lake City. Um, so every point here corresponds to, um, it doesn't show on the screenshot, but I think it's 100 people. Um, and you can see that like green is white and orange is Hispanics. Um, there is, like in this one census tract that I selected here, there is about 40%, 40 49% uh, whites and 47% Hispanic. But essentially what you can see on this map is the further east you go in Salt Lake City, the whiter. The further uh, west you go, especially like uh, essentially west of the interstate, we have like a, a huge uh, Hispanic population, especially in this upper quadrant there. And then here it's, it's much more mixed. But the further like around the university here uh, in, in the avenues, it's really predominantly white. Um, and there is like Salt Lake City, is not that ethnically diverse. Um, there are other areas like New York City where you can see this in extremes, right? Um, so you can see that Manhattan is essentially, except for uh, Chinatown in the lower area here, Manhattan is almost completely white, except for Chinatown, and then if you get up to Harlem, then uh, like right here, at the end of Central Park, suddenly no white person lives anymore. <laughs> and you can see these, these, these divides and you can see the, the New York boroughs um, very strongly. And this is actually like, this is census data uh, and this is here for the whole country. 
and it dynamically re-aggregates the points. Um, uh, like here, in this case, one, point, one dot is 2,500 people. So you can zoom out, and you can see then the distribution. Like you can get a sense of where people live, uh, and you can get a sense of the ethnic makeup. And I think that the one other very interesting case is Los Angeles. Um, so Los Angeles is kind of like a, a very diverse city. We can see that it, like here, I'm sure when we zoom in, we'll see um, some segregation. Uh, but uh, as a whole, Los Angeles is pretty mixed uh, ethnically. Okay, uh, next we'll talk about choropleth maps. And so the principle of choropleth maps is that areas are shaded or patterned in proportion to a measurement and each spatial unit is filled with a uniform color or pattern. So this is what we saw with the electoral map here earlier. Uh, this is an early example for illiteracy in France. Uh, you can see that the area around Paris is very light uh, and so the people uh, in urban areas, even in 1826, were much more literate than people here in the Bretagne, for example, uh, or in other rural areas. Um, this is the map that we saw here, uh, that we saw on your handout, and now if I take all of those pixels and map them to a bar chart, and all of the blue pixels, um, this is what I get. Like the red pixels here are 2.5 million square miles, uh, and the blue pixels are uh, 0.5 uh, million square miles. So it's about five times as much red as blue in this map versus Bush one with 62 to 59 million. So there is simply no proportionality between uh, the amount of ink that we have uh, on the screen uh, or on the paper uh, compared to what we see in the data. And so this would be, be what we call the lie factor. Um, I also like this comic very much. Um, get, get geographic profile maps, which are basically just po uh, population maps. So whenever you look at a map like this, and you don't standardize, uh, standardize your area by population, you're essentially just looking at where do people live. And it's very hard to see any meaningful trends uh, for yourself. Uh, this is like a, um, a 3D map of uh, the population density. And I kind of like it, even though it's 3D, um, just because it shows us like these big spikes it shows it very nicely, much more so than um, just the color could actually show. And you see the big spikes in the northeast, uh, and then you can see uh, the spike uh, in California, and then Salt Lake City is like this little uh, spike in the desert. <laughs> One way of kind of improving this choropleth map a little bit is uh, to show the percentage of the vote instead of just the winner takes all, right? But this doesn't really solve the underlying problem of the proportion, like the disproportional area versus population, but it solves a little bit the problem of the win margin. So this would be a little bit of a fairer map. Um, if we do this like by population density, essentially with this dotted approach, we get a better sense, right? So now we have a fair distribution of blue versus red mostly. Um, and so we can see like that here, the, the, it's red, but there's a lot of white in here. And so that essentially tells us that there is not a lot of people in here. Um, this is an interesting approach, and that's kind of like what I would say, if you want to use a choropleth map, this is what you should always use. Um, and so the idea of this, um, of this paper is to use a prior, like in the Bayesian analysis, that you have some kind of prior, um, and that could be population, right? Um, so you essentially, instead of showing some absolute count, like this here is an absolute count of mischief, like the crime mischief, which is like a minor crime uh, in Canada. Um, and so you, it would look like Ontario and Quebec um, have massive, like a massive problem with mischief. But of course, these are all the biggest states in Canada. Uh, and so it's not surprising that they have the biggest amounts of mischief. And so then we could simply say, okay, let's divide this well, let's have a prior of population and how, let's look at how um, we have a deviation from uh, like per person, a mischief per person. And so what we see here is sadly that the Arctic countries, Nunavut um, and so on, have a, like a high number of mischiefs per person. And so why could that be problematic? This land is like, there's very, very few people that live, it, live there, right? 
Um, and so we have uh, a big potential for a sampling error. Like we, there, there's a lot of uh, like randomness that can happen here. And so if we, if we actually um, use what's called like the sign surprise in their model, but when we have a prior that also takes into account for the variability when we analyze very small numbers, um, then we get this map. And so, oops. And so here we see that there is actually not a, uh, not a like, high array than you would uh, uh, statistically expect in the northern uh, states and in northern territories. Um, and that uh, Ontario and Quebec are actually lower than you would expect. Um, this is also like a problem, for example, that this sample, like this problem of low numbers, um, also leads to, um, like when you just look at the rankings of which schools are, are, doing, are getting the best grades in the United States, if you just look at the ranking on average grade per student, usually it's very, very small schools that do well. And the reason for that is very likely sampling error, not school size. So if you could account for the sampling problems, you will actually find that larger schools don't necessarily mean worse grades uh, than smaller schools. Um, here is a surprise map for unemployment. So this is the per capita uh, unemployment rate. <coughs> and you see that there, has, there are some like, really weird artifacts um, in the like, less populated areas of the country. Um, and if we instead use the sign surprise, which takes this into account, we can see that all of this essentially goes away, that the middle of the country is roughly average, um, and there is essentially like, about average population. But we do see these like, um, meaningful outliers, for example, the Detroit area having a much higher unemployment rate and the Los Angeles area having a much higher unemployment rate. Um, I also like this core clef map. This is a bear density in Finland, uh, visualized as bears. Um, and then there's a couple of fun ones like the baseball territories um, across the country. Um, so we see that um, like Yankees are the background gray. So they essentially, where there's no home team, uh, people are Yankee fans. Uh, and this is in 2014. Uh, for basketball and essentially the Lakers, this was uh, like st uh, when Kobe Bryant still played, the Lakers were a big deal everywhere where they didn't have a home team. So the Utah Jazz, for example, are around here and there's not a lot of like Utah Jazz fans outside of the immediate geographical region, right? Uh, whereas people in Quebec actually prefer uh, the uh, Lakers to the Canadian Raptors, like French versus English. Um, and there's many of those maps, so this is like a link, like I'm going to skip over this. Um, there's different um, aspects of well-being in the United States on this New York Times piece. Um, let's just explore it on your own if you're interested. Okay, I want to move on to proportional symbols map. Uh, and so the idea of proportional symbols map is that instead of coloring, we use a symbol instead, uh, instead and we scale that symbol according to the data. Um, and so then we get something like this. So here the scale, um, like the symbols are scaled by, um, by the vote margin. For um, the Bush versus Kerry race. Um, and so we can see like the Northeast here um, has like a large margins uh, for Kerry. Um, and then here we have in the essentially um, South eastern region, we have like consistently uh, a mar like larger or margins of uh, vote margins for Bush, uh, and so these kind of like they are a little bit uh, let's say fairer representations um, because they kind of take into account population. But what do we have? What's the problem with these kinds of maps? Well, we have a lot of overlap, right? especially in densely populated areas, here it's really hard to recognize individual uh, dots anymore. So it's like we couldn't see that if there is like one district that is very Republican somewhere up here, it might simply not be visible because um, there's so many blue circles on top of it. Um, this is a, a Clinton versus Trump map um, with shifts to the left and right. So, um, and I also do like that map. Uh, also the interactive part uh, of it. This is like a scrolly telling visualization. And so we can see that uh, Trump won big uh, in essentially the Rust Belt area. 
Like, um, so here we essentially only show the Midwest area around here. Um, and then Clinton made gains in urban areas and in Utah, uh, compared to Obama in 2012. Uh, and so this is kind of like a neat visualization because the size of the arrows here encodes the magnitude of the swing. So this is kind of a little bit related to the swing map that, we sh that I showed earlier, uh, but it is of course um, different because it's only making a comparison between two years and it doesn't show us absolute values, right? So it only shows us change here. So we just look you from this map, uh, it looks like Utah went Democratic, but it of course did not. Um, and here's another map that um, shows, like it uses these triangles as proportional symbols. Um, and here the size of the, um, uh, the size of the triangle is the height, is the number of total votes cast. The width is the margin of the votes. So Chicago had a large number of votes um, and um, the Clinton won it by a large margin. Whereas the, here in Florida, you can see that there is a lot of people, but Clinton won it by a smaller margin. So this is like a, an encoding with two different parameters on a glyph. Uh, what do, you, do you like this map? I see some head shaking. So you have to kind of very consciously think about what you're looking at, right? Um, you see the big ones, like you see the big triangles, but then what does it exactly mean? You have to think about it a little bit more. Um, so I don't think it's the greatest approach, but it is, it's certainly interesting. Uh, this shows the like, um, were people that were affected back by Hurricane Katrina, uh, where they filed for assistance, so essentially where they moved to uh, from the New Orleans area. And so you can see that essentially they stayed in the larger regions mostly, or uh, moved into like the surrounding regions from Texas to Florida, uh, and very few moved to other uh, areas. Um, this is like proportional symbols map of um, New York City, John Kerry versus George Bush. So we can see that there is some local uh, political le um, leanings. So for example, that on the uh, Upper West Side, people tend to be more democratic. Whereas on the upper e or on the on the, e on the east side around here, uh, we have like a lot of conservatives. Um, but of course, people are making fun of these circles, like the killer circles threaten America. They're kind of overused to some degree, and they have the problem. Uh, they have the problems that we talked about with circles that they are kind of hard to perceive in terms of size, um, and so on. And this is a piece that actually uses proportional text uh, to show us the most common. Suriname in a certain area. Unfortunately, this, this piece is not available anymore, at least not without paying for a National Geographic subscription. Uh, this is the Northeast, and what you can see, like the blue ones here are English names, uh, the red ones here are Spanish names, um, and the green ones here are Irish names. Uh, and you can see that like the Murphys and O'Briens and the Sullivans are in the Boston area, the green ones. Uh, versus here, like we have a big Smith cluster. Uh, this is also an interesting technique, um, fat fonts. Um, the idea of fat fonts is to make the, the weight of the fonts, the, like, the proportion of black pixels to white pixels for each digit proportional to the value of the digit. Um, so one here has essentially uh, about a tenth of the black pixels as nine have, has. And so uh, you can see the difference between one, two, and three in the weight of the fonts. And then you can actually encode data, like for example here, elevation data uh, with those fat fonts. And you can zoom in and you can actually read the data. So here we have 489. Um, and um, here is an example of population in the United States using this approach. Um, so it is pretty neat, pretty interesting. I think it's a wallpaper that I would like to hang up in my apartment. Uh, but I don't think it's necessarily a great data visualization, right? Um, it's intriguing, uh, it's, people spend time and play with it, uh, but it, it does, it's not the most efficient way of com communicating data. Okay, and we have a couple of minutes less left. Let's talk a little bit about contour uh, or isopleth maps. Uh, these are really like, nice if we want to show things like uh, flow or currents, like wind or currents. So here is our Halley's lines of equal magnetic declination um, on this like historic map. Here is a historic uh, wind map. So these are like the 
um, predominant winds uh, in these areas, which were of course important when you like, wanted to sail from one area to the other one. And take a close look. Can you like get a sense of what the direction of the wind is here? It's going like in the Atlantic Ocean. Oops. In the Atlantic Ocean, it's going this way. Yes. Yeah. So it's like a little bit of just varying, varying the stroke with a little bit to make them point like arrows, kind of shows the directionality of the wind. But this is a very nice piece. This is actually a live wind map um, of the United States. Um, and so we can see that there it is, it's actually quite windy um, east of the Rocky Mountains right now. Oh, this is live? This is live, yeah. And we can also look at interesting weather events like Hurricane Sandy, for example. So we can see the hurricane very well here. Or, what else? Hurricane Isaac. So we can really see the eye of the hurricane as well. Um, and then uh, these kind of contours are also used in topographic maps. Um, for, to show elevation, right? So if you really want to, like, if you want to hike or climb somewhere, you can count these isocontours to know how much the elevation change is going to be, which is super useful uh, in, in like hiking or biking or climbing maps and so on. Um, here we have like a visualization, and we see many of those this year, um, of an isocontour that shows us like the expected path of a storm with its extent, but also like a region of uncertainty. So, like, of course we can't predict where a storm is actually going, moving with absolute certainty, so there is like a cone of uncertainty, um, but um, it's, well, uh, and, and you could show this like with these like, uh, shaded lines here. Okay, so I think I'll just call it uh, a day. Sorry that we didn't get further, and sorry for the AV troubles. I hope that will be fixed by Thursday, and then we'll keep up with maps uh, on Thursday, and then move on to graphs.